Okay, friends, I was told that you're all um, meditation and mindfulness leaders. So let's begin today with a practice. Meditation practice, okay? Okay, I think half the people are uh, meditation. <laughs> uh, fortunately, this practice is very short. Three breaths. I'll tell you what we're going to do, and then we do together. For the first breath, when we breathe in and out, I want you to gather your attention on the breath. The second breath, when you're breathing in and out, allow you to feel the whole body. And then the third breath, as you breathe in and out, I allow you to calm the body. Sounds good? Okay. If you're ready, let's begin now. First breath, gather attention in breath. Out breath, second breath, experience whole body, third breath, calming the body. And with that, my friends, thank you for your attention. I wanted to start with this practice uh, for, two, for two reasons. The first reason is to show that meditation is not, it doesn't take a long time. You don't have to sit for one hour uh, right, to, to meditate. It can be as simple as three breaths. Also, you might notice this. You notice that in the three breaths, you feel better already. Now, if, you have, if you have any mental or emotional tension when you came in, you find that in just three breaths, you're like, ah, I feel better. And here's, a better th here's even, even better news, is that it's not just for you. So I know that you're all experienced leaders. However, if you have some uh, client or your friend come to see you, and they never meditated before, and you do that for the first time, they will still feel better. So for, even for a first time person, they will benefit. So that's the power of meditation. And so I want to first share this practice with you so that you can bring this home and share it with the people, uh, who, your clients, your, your students, or people you care about. And if you want to, uh, it's easier to remember if you use a hand. Right? So first one is gather attention. Second is, let me remember, experience the body. Third is, calm the body. Um, anybody recognize where this came from? This practice. This is the first four steps of the Anapanasati Sutta. But I, I simplify it into three steps. Because the first two steps is, is basically the gathering of attention. So I didn't make this up. Right? This, is, this is what the Buddha taught. I just simplify it so that uh, even I can understand. <laughs> so again, this is another, another lesson here, which is a lot of things the Buddha taught, they're very valuable. They're applicable to everybody, but the language is a little bit of a, of a barrier. So all we have to do is to simplify the language, and then whatever the Buddha taught, immediately people can benefit. Okay, so this is the three breath practice. I want to go through that again with the hand signal. Remember everybody? Gather, attention, yes? Whole body, calm body. Okay, since you're all experts, shall we do another exercise now? This time we do four breaths because you're experts. The first three breaths are the same. The fourth breath, I like you to bring up joy in the fourth breath. Bring it in, breathe in joy, breathe out joy. Okay? Okay, let's do that again. First breath, gather attention. Second breath, experience body. Third breath, calming the body. Fourth breath, bring up joy. And thank you for your attention. Anybody, some of you will recognize where that the fourth step came from. The fourth step also came from the Anapanasati Sutta. Anapanasati Sutta. It is the, it's the fifth step of the Anapanasati Sutta. And here you recognize again the genius, the genius of the Buddha. If I, if I just tell everybody, everybody bring out joy, 
Some people can do it, most people cannot. However, if I go through these steps, you notice it's much easier right, to bring out joy. And the reason is because the joy depends on uh, the combination of the tranquility and the energy. Right? And so that's why the Buddha put them in that sequence. Gather attention, experience the body, relax, relax the body, and then bring out joy. And then he's like, wow. And you recognize this, like some large number of you, in four breaths already can bring out joy. Joy on demand. It's like, it's like if you never heard this before, it, it's mind-blowing. You can bring out joy in four breaths. So this is uh, the first thing I hope you'll bring back for your, for your friends and, and your family and people you care about. So with that, I want to start with a story. This is the story of a man called Upali. So Upali was somebody who was uh, a person during the Buddha's time, a life during the Buddha's time. And Upali, he is, he is, he's not a Buddhist. He is of another religion called, called the Jain, the Jain religion. Right? Uh, and Up there's something about Upali, which is at first he's very, very smart. He's very learned. He's a very good meditator. And his family is very rich. And so he's a big donor to his, to his community, the Jain community. And because of all the combination, all these factors, Upali is very famous. He, not just in his community, like, like throughout India, very famous. So one day Upali had a debate with the Buddha. And at the end of the debate, Upali was like, wow. He was so impressed with the Buddha. And so Upali asked the Buddha, can I be your disciple? So in other words, he wants to leave the other religion. He don't, he don't want to be a Jain anymore. He wants to be a Buddhist. So what did the Buddha say? The Buddha said, Upali, somebody famous like you, you should consider carefully before you make that high request. And Upali was shocked. I mean, Upali knows about his own value. right? He said, if it's any other master, if I say I want to be his student, he will put up a huge banner. They said, Upali is my student. Right, but you, you tell me to reconsider. Now I'm, I'm even more impressed with you. Now I, I want to be your student even more. And what did the Buddha say? The Buddha gave him a condition. The Buddha said, Upali, I know your family is very rich. I know you give a lot of money to the jinns. If you become my student, I want you to continue to give to that community. Yeah, blew my mind. U Upali, it blew his mind as well. And Upali said, if it's any other master, he would say, give your money to my people, not to their people. <laughs> but you say, continue to give to them. So now I, I want to be a student even more. So Upali asked for a third time. And so for a third time, now the Buddha said, okay, fine. Now he's accepted. Uh, the reason I want to start with this story before my talk is because the rest of my talk will be very Buddhist-centric. It will be centered on Buddhism. And so I don't want to give the impression that we are like, uh, pushing down or pushing away other religions. Right? Because the, the Buddhist attitude to non-Buddhists, even starting from the Buddha himself, was open arms, open heart. Right? As in the Upali story. He didn't want to create tension between Upali and his former community. So he told them, continue to give to them. Don't give to me. Right. So this is the attitude. So whenever we talk about Buddhist-centric uh, uh, topics, it's always good to keep the attitude. Open heart, open arms. So with that, I like to, so the first slide I want to show you is, has to do with uh, religion. What is the state of a religion in the world today? Uh, not so good. <laughs> in, let's see. In advanced, uh, so this is uh, America. There, and it's not unique to America. There appears to be, uh, in all developed countries, there appears to be a sliding of religion. Uh, especially the, the, the most, what you call the oldest religion there, seems to be the hardest hit. So in the case of Christianity, for example, like in just a few short decades, they went from 90% to 63%, which is a lot. And the people who, who say they have no religion, they went from 5% to 29%. How, 
how about, uh, okay, uh, why? Why is this happening? Uh, my, I'm guessing everybody have, uh, you're guessing the same thing. You're all guessing young people. <laughs> and if you guess young people, you are right. <laughs> so this is a chart of uh, among ages. And again, so the, the purple chart are people with no religion. And as expected, the younger you are, the less religious you are. And you say, okay, maybe, and they are young now, but maybe as they get older, they get religion. Uh, no. <laughs> so this is again the US study. So you find uh, throughout the decades. And you find that uh, those, uh, so first thing is every decade, there tend to be some increase of young people who have no religion. And those who have no religion tend to stay as no religion later. Right, so, so the trend continues. Uh, so this is America and Christianity. Uh, what about South Korea and Buddhism? Not good. <laughs> sorry, to, sorry to be bearer of bad news. <laughs> but you all know. <laughs> so this is the South Korean numbers. right? Uh, number of affiliated uh, went up from 23 to 27 million. Buddhists went down. Right. A percentage wise is uh, this is about the same because population grow, but it's not good because even if it's about the same, it's only about 15% of the country is Buddhist, of your country. And again, why? And again, you guess it right, young people. Right? You look at this chart, young, pe <laughs> young people only 10%. General population of Buddhists in Korea, 15%. Young people, 10%. Not good. <laughs> So, what to do? So my friends, I have good news. I like to claim, and you can, uh, you can prove me wrong. I like to claim that as the world become more scientific and more secular, there can be more practicing Buddhists in Korea and in the world, if we do this right. I'm, I'm going to repeat that again because this is important. My friends, we can reverse this trend. We can reverse this if we work together and do it right. And we can do it in a way that is beneficial for us, beneficial for people, beneficial for the whole world, and beneficial for our friends in other religions as well. Everybody wins, nobody loses. We can do that. So for the rest of this lecture, uh, I like to, I have done a little bit of that, and so I'd like to share with you what I've done, and hopefully that will help move this in this direction. So um, a bit of my story. Uh, in the year 2000, I joined this tiny startup company called Google. So this, was, uh, this picture was taken in about 19, at the end of 1999 or beginning of 2000 or something. Uh, this was the whole company of Google back then. <laughs> I, I joined this group. And of course now we have, I don't know, 100,000 employees or something. I don't even, I lost count. So this was what I joined. And then uh, in 2003, as I told you the story yesterday, in 2003, I had this epiphany where I figured out what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, right? which was to create the conditions for world peace by scaling inner peace, inner joy, and compassion worldwide. That's what I want, that's what I want to do, scale inner peace, inner joy, compassion. And I figured that the way to do that, because I come from a business world, if I were to go around talking about goodness, peace, joy, compassion, it will not change anything. Because all the audience, they'll say, yeah, yeah, these are good things. They'll clap. And then they go home, nothing change. So the only way to affect change is, is uh, with upaya, skillful means. And the upaya for normal uh, secular people is what benefits them. If we can benefit them in a way that also benefits dharma and the world, then things will spread. And the way to do that was success and profits. Right. I'll help people, I'll help individuals and companies become more successful, more profitable in a way where peace, joy, and compassion are unavoidable as side effects. Unavoidable. And, and I'm open about it. I'm, I don't lie about this. If we do that, then 
peace, joy, compassion was spread, then we had the conditions for world peace. And I want, I want to do that in my lifetime. And so uh, I led this team that created something, uh, a curriculum to do that. We call it Search Inside Yourself. Uh, by the way, we, we did it as a joke. <laughs> Because Google is a search company, right? So let's search inside ourselves. If somebody proposed that, I will laugh. And I said, okay, if everybody laughs, let's, let's do that. <laughs> so we created this curriculum. It is about helping people succeed with, like I said, peace, joy, compassion being un unavoidable as side effects. And um, it was created with a, this a small team. And the key member of this team is this person, Norman Fisher. <laughs> he is an American Zen master. Uh, he, was, he was the abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center. And as you, as you might know, the San Francisco Zen Center is one of the most important Zen centers in America. And so he was one of the most important Buddhists in America. And he's Zen, uh, or Sion. And so therefore, a lot of what I'm about to tell you later, a lot of you will recognize, because a lot of it comes from the, uh, the Zen tradition. Um, let's see. So I, be, I became the teacher, uh, so I, I helped to develop this, but I, I couldn't teach it, right, because I don't feel qualified to be a teacher. So Norman was a teacher, and then we invited other like Zen, uh, like senior Zen teachers to be teachers. And then what happened? And then in 2008 and 2009, somebody might remember what happened. There was a, there was a huge financial crisis. So, Everybody was affected, so we had to cut our budgets. Every department's budget was cut. And so my boss, at uh, the time he was the director of Google University, he came to me and he said, because with the cut budget, you have to teach. I'm pointing to me, you have to teach. I said, but I'm not qualified. I mean, who am I? Just look at me, I'm just some engineer. <laughs> and so we had this discussion back and forth, and finally my boss came to me with a very simple ultimatum. He said, two choices, very simple. You teach, or the program goes away. You choose one. So I have no choice but to teach, even though I'm not qualified. So those of you students who look at me and say, yeah, this guy is yeah, not qualified to teach, I agree with you. <laughs> you are right. <laughs> but somehow, I ended up in this situation as, as the teacher. So we did that. And to my surprise, it became the most popular class in Google. It was extremely popular. And after that, I wrote a book about it. Oh, by the way, the book was also an accident. Uh, so because, because the class was so popular, I had to like, train more teachers. And in order to train more teachers, I had to write, I had to write the notes, like what I, what I say in class. And then as I was writing my notes, the first week, I realized, wait a minute, I'm writing a book. <laughs> so I, I asked for time off from my boss. My boss, her name was Karen. I said, can I take uh, 13 weeks, so three months? Can I take 13 weeks off to write this book? And Karen was very, very nice. Karen said, are you sure you can write a whole book in 13 weeks? And I say, I don't know, but I know one way to find out. <laughs> so she gave me 13 weeks off. And turns out Karen was right. I could not write a book in 13 weeks. It took me 14 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I blame? I blame the Dalai Lama. Because, because he was in town for one week, so one week I couldn't work. <laughs> I spent the whole week with him. <laughs> so, blaming Dalai Lama, that's what I, I like to do. So I wrote a book and it became like international bestseller, uh, including number one in Korea, uh, thanks to you. Thank you for spending your money on my book. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And it was endorsed by, uh, like I said, the Dalai Lama himself and two presidents. So that's how, that's how he knows a good book. Like the Dalai Lama and two presidents can't, both, can't all be wrong at the same time, right? Well, let, at least that's what I say when I joke. And then, yeah, I was very lucky. I, I got on the front page of the newspaper. I got to speak at TED. I got to speak at the UN. Oh, by the way, uh, during that time, uh, Ban Ki-moon was uh, Secretary General, so I was sitting on Ban Ki-moon's chair. So, the next question you might ask is, what is Search Inside Yourself? What do we teach here? There are three big parts. The first big part is attention training. Training people uh, to master their attention. The second part uh, is something we call intrapersonal intelligence. 
which is intelligence about yourself, which means uh, knowing yourself, understanding yourself, self-knowledge, and not just knowing yourself, able to regulate your emotions. So self-knowledge and self-mastery. The third part is what we call interpersonal intelligence, which is intelligence regarding other people. And here we have empathy and social skills. Well, empathy means feeling how other people feel, and then social skills means uh, serving people, basically. So a, a little bit of detail. Attention training, it means this. It means learning to calm the mind, learning to focus the mind, learning to have the mind that is both calm and clear at the same time. So basically an expansion of what we did this morning, I mean, what we did and more, right? To reach the state, um, how should I put it? We, when I started running this class, it was a seven-week class. We meet one day a week. By the end of seven weeks, I expect my students to be able to calm the mind on demand. And uh, if they are like, uh, what do you call it, triggered, something bad happens to them, they're able to calm the mind, even in that situation, sometimes. Right? So it's, it's a useful skill. So uh, why? Why do we want to do this? Because this class was advertised as an emotional intelligence class. And attention, the ability to master your attention is the foundation of emotional intelligence. So we have to do this as a whole module because it's, it's that important. Once we're done with that module, we teach them self-knowledge and self-mastery, which includes skills like aware of emotion, but not just aware of emotion, uh, what do you call it? Assessment, being able to access yourself uh, accurately, accurate self-assessment, and then surprisingly self-confidence. Right? So, so there is a form of self-confidence where you just go around oh, pretending you're the best, but inside you know, it's like, it's like, I'm not the person, I'm just pretending. And then so it's very fragile. However, if you have deep self-knowledge and you acknowledge all your weaknesses to yourself and then your confidence in, in that situation, that confidence is very strong. It's not easy to shatter. So, and so and in addition to that, we have self-regulation, which is now that you know yourself, learn to regulate your emotion to some degree. For example, uh, your mother-in-law says something, you don't get angry half the time. That's pretty good already. <laughs> so here's that level of regulation. And the other thing is, uh, again, could be surprising to you. And this was, it, we found it's important. Motivation, right? Which is we help people to find their deepest inner, inner meaning, inner purpose. And then aligning their work and inner purpose. And that's how we find they help, they motivate themselves towards their goal. So this come, all comes under intra-personal intelligence, intelligence about self. Interpersonal intelligence begins with loving kindness, meta. Could be surprising, but uh, I'll explain to you later when we do some exercise. Uh, empathic listening, listening to people mindfully, right, and with receiving their emotion and then leading people with compassion. So we did some compassion exercises and having difficult conversations. So how do we train this? For attention, uh, yes, uh, all of you expected this. No surprise. Shamatha and Vipassana. But not just Shamatha and Vipassana. Uh, this one, the third one could be surprising to you. We, learned, we teach about letting go. And also like, uh, all four postures that the, the Buddha explained, like walking and eating, standing, sitting, so on. So we do, we do all the exercises. This is attention training. For self-knowledge and mastery, you do body scan, journaling, equanimity. And again, this could be surprising. Uh, we talk about emptiness of self. And again, I'll come to this in a minute. And then social skills, again, could be surprising to you. Uh, listening is not surprising. Uh, mental habits, what does that mean? So, okay, let's do this exercise. I like everybody, uh, this, this is very short, it's only take five seconds. In five seconds, I'd like you to bring to mind somebody you care about. 
maybe, maybe your child or something, right? And then just think to yourself, just think, I wish for this person to be happy. Right? And then that's it. Okay? That's five seconds begins now. Thank you. Okay, now the same exercise, except you secretly choose one person in this room. Okay, don't, don't, don't look at them. No. <laughs> A secret. <laughs> Just choose one person and just think, I wish for this person to be happy. Okay, now five seconds begins now. Thank you for your attention. First thing is you notice when you do this exercise, you're smiling, right? It's very happy. It's to be on the giving end of kindness. It makes you happy already. And, but it gets even better. Is, which is that if you do that, uh, some, if you do that a lot, right, not just one time, but you do that a lot, what happens? People notice. Somehow they know, even though you're just thinking, right? But if you, every time you pass by somebody, you just think, I wish for you to be happy, and, but you don't say it out loud, eventually he looks at you and says, wow, you're a friend. And he doesn't really know why, but it's because there's this bit of heart, con heart connection. And then imagine you do this a lot, what happens? What happens is that this becomes a mental habit, right? Habitually, you just look at human beings and this first thought is, I wish for this guy to be happy. That's the first thought. Why? Because it's a habit, for no other reason. Because you do so much, it's a habit. And then what happens? Habit becomes personality. Personality becomes character. Character becomes you. Therefore, by just doing something often enough, it becomes you. So just by doing this loving kindness exercise, five seconds, in, in fact, it takes no time because you can just pass by somebody and just think like that, just walk past. It takes no time, right? And if you do this a lot, you become a person of kindness, transformation of a human being, simply through mental habits. So when we say creating mental habits, this is what we're thinking. And again, I, I didn't make this up. Again, this is something that the Buddha talked about in, in, the, in the Nikayas, in the early Buddhist text. And the last item might be surprising to you, all of you, or some of you, which is Tonglen. Right? It's a very advanced uh, Tibetan practice we, we use for uh, a compassion exercise in the class. <laughs> Imagine coming to work <laughs> in the office and doing Tonglen. Right? So, this is what we basically what we do in a nutshell. And of course, you can buy the book. For those of you who haven't bought the book yet, you can buy the book. There's, there are a couple of things. <laughs> okay, it takes a while. <laughs> There's something you notice about this slide, and I want to highlight three things. The first thing is that anybody with these skills, even any one of these skills, can be more successful, can be very successful. Anyone, I'll just give you a random example. Uh, Self-assessment, accurate self-assessment. If you are a manager, that skill is something you must have. If you, if you don't have it, you will not be a successful manager. Why? Because we are human beings, we have flaws, <laughs> we have weaknesses. And if, you're, if you know these weaknesses uh, uh, honestly, as a manager, when you form a team, you can find people who can compensate for those weaknesses. That's why you're more successful. So this is one quality alone. Another quality, I just randomly choose one, right? Calm the mind, right? Imagine, I mean, in the office, there's always one guy who's always angry and you say something to him, he, he hits back at you. You can't work with this guy. But imagine this guy, same guy, now half the time he can say, okay, okay, he doesn't get angry. Suddenly you can work with him more. Suddenly he becomes more successful than before, right? And the last one is, uh, yeah, empathy, kindness. It's like every one of them, you do just one, you can be more successful. Imagine you do like all of them. It changes your work life. So that's the first, uh, first thing you notice. Also, of course, they're, good. they're all goodness qualities. There's nothing here that turns you into a bad person. Everything here all turns you into a good person. Right? So that's the first thing. The second thing you notice, is that these practices are all taught by the Buddha. And maybe not all, there are few and not, uh, journaling, 
journaling wasn't taught by the Buddha because they didn't have a convenient writing system equipment. So, so the Buddha never said, okay, everybody journey all day, but <laughs> that was something we invented. But everything else, for example, uh, the Buddha taught, so the, the Buddha taught Satipatthana, foundations of mindfulness. He taught four foundations of mindfulness. Three of them are here. For example, uh, so in other words, somebody who practices such inside yourself also at the same time practice Dharma. Right? Because he wants to be successful, but he ends up practicing Dharma. Right? And that's why it's life changing. And the third thing you notice, and this is a powerful, this I think is a powerful one. If you look at the list on the, on the yellow, the things we actually do, not a single item is religious. Every one of them is secular. Even Tonglen. Because in Tonglen, you're just like in your mind receiving people's suffering, and then you transform it into goodness and you spread it out. There is no religion that says you cannot breathe in people's suffering. It's like everything is secular. And we can practice Dharma in an entirely secular setting. So when I teach this, I, I, I make no secrets about it. I said, I know this is from the Buddhist teaching and this is secular. There's one other thing uh, some, some of you might notice, especially the Sunnims might notice this, it, because it kind of stands out when, when I look at the list, which is that there are some topics here which you could consider to be advanced topics in Buddhism. For example, the big example here is uh, uh, emptiness of self. I mean, emptiness is a big topic. It's an advanced topic in Buddhism, right? And some, in some, in some, some teachers and some um, meditation masters, they don't teach you until you, have, you, you pass certain curriculum. Equanimity, again, advanced topic. Right? We know that because uh, the Buddha's seven factors of enlightenment, equanimity is the last one, because you need the other six to get there. Right? So you notice that we don't shy away from the advanced topics. We go straight into them. Now, of course, seven weeks is not enough to fully cover emptiness of self. We can only begin to touch it, but we do begin to touch it. And my friends, this is one of the reasons why Search Inside Yourself was life-changing. Because we don't shy away from the advanced topics that go straight into people's hearts. And we can do it in a way that's entirely secular. Sorry, I need to organize my notes. So, I taught this class for a while. And uh, as I told you yesterday, so those of you who came to yesterday's class, you will hear this before, that uh, a lot of people got what they wanted from the class. Right? People got their promotions. Right? People got to solve the problems they couldn't solve before. Right? Because they were engineers, they needed to come up with a creative solution, and then they could not, so they just do what I teach them. Like, come to mind, come to mind. So meditate for 15 minutes. Like, oh, 15 minutes later, I got it. Right? They do enough time to get promotions. Right? People who become better managers because now they're able to interact with their people at a, at a level that their people appreciate. Because their people appreciate them, they become more effective. And if you're the boss, if your people more, become more effective, who wins? You win. Because you are the boss. Right? They're doing work for you. Right? So we have all these stories, and then there are like personal stories. Right? For example, the story I told yesterday of the Marine, right? the big guy who who discovered the ability not to say something nasty to his mother-in-law, <laughs> but does something. Usually, tell me, usually he would just shout. Ugh. And then because he's so big, he's, he's scary. They don't have a good relationship. But now they're okay. okay. Because sometimes he's able to... <laughs> third week of class. Halfway during class, he can do that already. <laughs> Life-changing. Right? And people's uh, marriages improve because they're able to interact with their spouses with less conflict. Uh, people who are grieving, they were able to manage their grief. And then uh, there are people that, that, that want to touch me the most, are transformational stories. Like people, they, they find themselves becoming a different person. Like, like somebody, the person who says, I now see the world and I see myself with kindness. 
That is transformative. This person just became a new person. So the thing I keep hearing over and over again in Search Inside Yourself was this. That's how I changed my life. Right? Come to work on a Monday, you take a class on Tuesday, and it's changed your life. Whoa. And because of, of that, that's why the class was so popular. Right? Because everybody tells, tells a friend, you know, I took this class, it changed my life. Like, really? Yeah, 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 you have to try it. That's why when I opened up the class for, for registration, the class is full in 30 seconds. That's why we have to keep expanding. Okay. Um, before I go further, there's one person I want to, uh, want to uh, highlight, which is if, if this is useful. I know a lot of you are, are, me are mindfulness and meditation teachers are trying to bring Dharma to the secular world. And this methodology, like, they've been trying, it works for uh, uh, lay people and young professionals. Uh, so the, this methodology, uh, my sister Chong Hun, Yu Chong Hun, can you stand up? He, she's very familiar with this because we train her, and so she can be a resource for you if, if that's useful. So feel free to talk to her anytime. Yeah. Thank you, Chong Hun. I know this Chong Hun is different from yesterday Chong Hun. So, so you got two Chong Huns for the price of one. <laughs> So this was the SIY, the Search Inside Yourself uh, experience. Uh, now I take a broader picture. Why are we successful, right? And, and one of the reasons we're successful is because of three teaching principles. The way we teach this. And these are the principles. Science, language, application. So what does that mean? So talking about science, it's like everything we say in class, we have to explain to it in scientific terms. Let me give you an example. So if you are not being scientific, right, if you are like a normal, uh, normal meditation class, you would say, you would tell the student, okay, you bring attention to your breath, do anapanasati, and then you can, you can become, uh, you can gain mastery over your emotion. And if you say that to a young professional in Google, he was like, like what? doesn't even make sense. I say, wait, I breathe, I, I bring awareness to breathing, and somehow I can regulate emotion. Makes no sense at all to him. So therefore, we, we end up having to explain everything scientifically. So the example for this is, uh, there's a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. It's over here. It's on the surface of the brain at the, at the, near the forehead. This part of the brain uh, is re related to executive function. This is the highest thinking part of the brain. It's also the part of the brain most uh, connected with attention. So uh, when you decide things, when you decide is this the right thing to do or not, when you consider things, the PFC is the most active. Then there's another part of the brain, oh by the way, in, in evolutionary terms, this was the last thing to evolve because it's, it's, it's the newest part of the brain. In contrast, there's a part of the brain that's very, very old. You see that in reptiles. Um, sorry, in, in, uh, in other uh, earlier mammals. Uh, it's called the amygdala. It's the inner part of the brain. This part of the brain has to do with uh, threat responses. Right? If you feel threatened, this part of the brain lights up. It's called the amygdala. And so, for example, if you see a tiger coming at you, <laughs> amygdala lights up. So what happens is the amygdala, it turns out, have a privileged function. When the amygdala lights up, it shuts down the PFC, which means what? Which means you stop thinking. You're just reacting. Then you might wonder, wait, why would nature give us such an equipment? It makes no sense. But it makes sense because if you see a tiger coming to you, what do you do? Two, two options. Either you fight or you run. Right? If, you, if you stop to think, hmm, what should I do? Tiger's coming. You die. <laughs> so those who don't think, they don't die. That's why they have children. <laughs> that's, that's, why they, that's why all the children have this function. <laughs> so the amygdala shuts down the PFC, uh, so that, which is fine. However, in modern day, 
as far as I know, very few people in this room ever have a tiger coming at you. <laughs> so when do you emit the light up? For example, when somebody says something that you feel insulted. Why? Because insulting you is like, it's, it's a threat to your ego. So the threat lights up. Threat system lights up, what happens is privilege. <laughs> then what happens? This thing shuts down. You stop thinking. Then what happens? You say something you regret later. And then after a while, you look back and say, why did, I, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Because I wasn't thinking. You literally were not thinking because PFC shuts down. This is the system. So when you do mindfulness of breathing, what happens? What happens is that this part of the brain is strengthened because you are training yourself in attention. Right? When your uh, attention runs away, bring it back, bring it back, it's like doing bicep curls. So your attention becomes very strong. Also, your PFC becomes very strong after a while. And because your PFC is very strong, it turns out this mechanism also can do the reverse, which is if your PFC is strong, it can down-regulate the amygdala. So the amygdala like triggers. Oh, this person just, just insulted me. Blah, 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 blah. I want to hit him. And then the PFC say, oh, brother, relax. We're fine. <laughs> and then you don't react. So this is how, when you bring attention to your breath a lot, you suddenly become very good at mastering your attention. It's through this neural mechanism. I mean, it's, it's kind of a long explanation, but once I explain to you, it makes sense. Right? And as I explain this to young professionals, it makes perfect sense. And then they get it, say, oh, that's why I should be bringing attention to the breath. And not, not just make sense, they want to do it because they want to have that capability. They want to be in capability where they're under stress, everything's going wrong, and they can, I can do this. Because why? Because they'll be successful. <laughs> and in doing that, they practice Dharma. So the first part, really important, the science. Everything you teach, for us at least, everything we teach, we have to have scientific basis and where possible, scientific explanation. The second uh, teaching principle is languaging. Specifically, uh, we try to be very precise with our languaging. Uh, I'll give you an example. An example of a non, of a normal language, or a normal teacher. Uh, you say, okay, everybody go deep into your emotion. Uh, if you say that to an engineer from Google, uh, the first question he asks you is, what is deep, what is shallow, how do you measure? <laughs> For that guy, it makes no sense. And so I, I have to be very precise. So what I say is, you bring a high resolution attention to the process of emoting. And then of course I explain why it's high resolution uh, perception. And then for the engineer, that makes perfect sense. And then I explain how to do that through mindfulness of the body and so on and so forth. I explain the whole, the whole pipeline. It's, it's scientific. And then the engineer goes, oh, I get it. Again, not just I get it, I want to do it. So that's the second principle. The third principle is application. Okay, this one was surprising to me. So first, what does that mean? Uh, it turns out that everything we teach, we have to tell them where the application is. So for example, we just did loving kindness, right? We just like bring somebody in mind and just wish for this person to be happy. Uh, and then we feel happier. For me, maybe because I'm stupid or something, uh, for me, I was like, why would anybody not want to do this? It's so obvious, right? You do this, you feel happy, everybody, the other person feels, everybody is happy, it's like, we are good. The world is better. Why would anybody need motivation for this? So I teach this in class, uh, engineers, the one engineer will raise a hand and say, why are we doing this? <laughs> Waste of time. <laughs> and so we have to explain that. Right? And the explanation is what we, I told you a bit earlier. Imagine walking into a meeting room. And imagine you look at every single person in the meeting room and your first thought is, I wish for this person to be happy. That's your first thought. Why? Because it's a habit. Remember we talked about mental habits earlier? 
So imagine you do this every time. Every time you walk into a meeting room, you look at him, and it's the very first thought. What happens? Over time, they like you. Over time, because they like you, they want you to succeed. Right? I mean, so if you ask for help, say, hey, Joe, can you help me? This? Oh, sure, of course. Because they like you. Over time, you're more successful. And so it turns out, <laughs> surprising to me, even loving kindness, I have to explain why you want to do this. And so this is the third thing. You have to, at least my experience, everything had to explain why. So this is the big picture, and I want to go to an even bigger picture. Which is, based on this experience, uh, I feel, and you could disagree with me, and please let me know if you disagree. I feel that to, to reach young people, especially young professionals, you have to teach Buddhism in a way that is understandable, accessible, practicable, impactful. So what does that mean? Understandable means the student, he, he or she thinks to himself or herself, I understand the teaching. And not just I understand the teaching, I understand how it actually works. So the example I gave you earlier, right? I understand, I mean the student says I understand that if I practice mindfulness of breath, then I can master my emotional life. Then I can be, have less suffering, I create less suffering for others. He, this person knows the relation, this relationship, this whole chain, because he or she understands the brain science. So understanding, that's part, understandable. That's part one. Uh, second thing is accessible. So understandable is not enough. Because you could understand the other teaching, I get it, but I can't practice. Why? It takes too long. <laughs> only, only the Sunim can do. Because Sunim, he's very smart, right? He's, he's taken thousands of hours of practice. I'm just me, I can't do anything. So, so he had to make it accessible also. So uh, accessibility is when the, your student thinks to himself or herself, I know how this Dharma is relevant to my life not just a monk's life, my life. And I know, so not just relevant, so I, I can do it. Like even I can do it. You know, your students have a job, right? They have to be successful, they have to feed their family, sometimes they have to support their parents, there's so much stress. And if the students still think, I can practice this, then they're successful. Of course, you have to help them. But accessibility, that's the second point. The third point is practicability which is there are steps that can be taken. So first, that there are steps that the student understands, and this person thinks, I can take these steps. So let me give you an example. If uh, we talk about dealing with triggers, triggers means something happened, like somebody says something insulting to you, and suddenly you get very angry, and you do something that, because your PFC shut down, you do something that you regret later. So that is de dealing with triggers. So imagine we don't have steps. Imagine I just, we just tell our students, okay, next time this happens, just let it go. I can't do that. <laughs> He's insulting me, how do I let it go? But so, it, so in our class, we always give them steps that they can do. So in, this, in the case example of a trigger, we say first stop. Don't do anything for half a second. Don't say anything, don't do anything. Half a second, that's it. Okay, I can do. Second thing, breathe. Ah, I can do. Third thing, notice your body. Why? Because emotion is in the body, right? So if you feel stressed, for example, you're tightening of chairs, tightening of this. Notice. Can you do that? Ah, I can do. Because uh, not, normally they cannot do, but because they already stop, already breathe, you can do notice. Next thing is re uh, reflect what just happened. Again, the steps are important because if you just tell the student, okay, reflect, no. <laughs> but after he can stop, breathe, notice, ah, and then they can reflect, okay, this is what happened. And then finally respond in the way that is understanding and compassionate. Then can let go. So again, every step is doable 
given the previous step. And then because there are steps, you can solve the problem. So it's really important to give steps to your students. Uh, let me see. I want to give an example I, with your permission. And please tell me later that this is a bad topic. I want to give an example of something that is not in the class. But the Buddha did this very well, in my opinion. Which is, uh, I mean, so the Buddha did everything really well, in my opinion. Uh, one example here about the steps is, imagine this. So the, the mind that is most conducive to nirvana, to the final breakthrough into nirvana, the mind that is most conducive is when you're perfect in equanimity and perfect in mindfulness. And so it's, it's, uh, your mindfulness is purified by your equanimity. So that's, that's why the mindfulness and equanimity are both in the seven factors of enlightenment. So mindfulness purified by equanimity, equanimity means what? means that your mindfulness is no longer affected by sense, sense desire. Because of that, it sees things as they actually are. And because you see things as they actually is, you can break through to nirvana. That mind is most conducive. So if you have no steps, you might tell your students, okay, perfect equanimity. How do I do that? Well, just do it. Perfect equanimity. Perfect your mindfulness. Uh, it's very, very hard. I, I tried it. It's, I couldn't do it. So what did the Buddha do? I, in my opinion, he, he, what he did was beautiful. He created the steps. Right? The first step is, is joy. So the Buddha gives this uh, analogy. He says it's, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like, you know, in the old days, in the uh, uh, Buddha's days, they have pow powder for bathing, and then they put the water in, and then they made the powder into a ball, for, so they can use the ball for shower, for, ba for bath. And so the Buddha says, like, imagine that the guy who just put, keeps sprinkling water into the powder, and that's kneading, until the whole ball is full of water, then it's solid as a ball. And the Buddha said, imagine the water is like joy and the powder is the mind. So just keep adding joy and eventually you can focus the mind with joy. Can do, very hard, but uh, a lot easier. Uh, in my experience, anybody with two, three thousand hours of training can do this. Okay, sorry, I wouldn't say anybody, but I'll was, I was, I was, I say the reverse. I'll say once you have two to three thousand hours of of training, of meditation training, this becomes possible. Right? So it, it doesn't take 10,000 hours. So the second step, the Buddha says, okay, now you have this mind that is, that is sprinkled with joy, right? You get to a state where uh, you're so concentrated that this, so, so when it's sprinkled, it's, it's effortful, right? Because the person has to do it. Imagine the joy is so strong that it's effortless. It's just joy. And because it's effortless, your mind just spontaneously, like perfect in concentration. And because it's perfect in concentration, the thoughts fade away. No thoughts. So the Buddha said, do that. That's the second step. And the analogy he gave is like a pawn. Uh, by the way, in India, weather is hot. So cool is a good thing. So a pawn, where there's cool water coming from inside. Shh, the whole pond, wow. Amazing. Again, uh, very hard to do, but if you've already done the first step, it's doable. The third step, the Buddha says, okay, now you uh, let go of the, that, that energetic joy and just calm down, right? and then just have peaceful joy. And in that peaceful joy from calming down, wisdom factors begin to show themselves. Recent factors are mindfulness, equanimity, clear comprehension, sampajana. So, and the Buddha's analogy is, it's like a pond with lotus inside the pond. And the Buddha said, again, the water represents joy, and the, pond, the lotus represents wisdom. So now there's wisdom factors surrounded by joy. And then the last step is what we just said. From there, the mind lets go of even that quiet joy. Because the mind is now so refined that even that little bit of joy is, is too noisy. Ah, let go. 
and now the mind is perfectly equanimous, perfectly mindful. And the Buddha said that is the, he calls it the pure, bright mind. And with a pure, bright mind, that is how you go into the nirvana. So these steps, they're called the jhanas. For those, some of you know, you, you know the punchline. Uh, and the word, by the way, the word jhana, when transliterated to Chinese, is called chana. It's uh, shortened to chan. And then when it came to Korea, Korea is pronounced as sion. So those of you sion, sion, yeah. So uh, sion Buddhist, this is your, this is your heritage. Yeah, it's, it's not something new. But this is an example of the skillfulness of steps, even for enlightenment, even for the advanced teachings. So, friends, uh, oh, the last thing, uh, impactful. Not just practicable, the student have to think that, understand, the student understand that this thing impacts my life in some positive way. So, for example, the students know it's going to help my, my career, it's going to help my marriage, it's going to help my relationship with my kids or my, my parents. And the, um, the best test is what the students say, this thing changed my life. If your students say, I learned Dharma and it changed my life, you know you're successful. So these four points, they are so important, my friends, that if you remember only one thing from this lecture, remember these four things. Understandable, accessible, practicable, impactful. If you can make your teaching of Dharma have these four qualities, you will be successful at reaching uh, young professionals. And not just young professionals, I like to say everybody, young and old, from any religion. Okay, let's see. Um, the next question is how do we do this? Or rather, more accurately, who do we learn this from? Who is our model? Our model is the Buddha, again. Right. So everything that I've, I talked about, uh, almost everything I found from the early Buddhist text. So the way the Buddha taught, right, it's amazing. Like his, everything I talked about, the steps, right, the making things understandable, accessible, practicable, the Buddha did all of that. So for those of you who haven't read the early Buddhist text, uh, it's called the Nikayas. I, and if you're a teacher, I would suggest that uh, if you find time to do that, I know it takes a long time. It took me 16 months to finish reading the whole thing, but it's very useful. And I hope that if you do that, you'll find suggestions or methods to do what, uh, these, four, these four things. Right. Um, and I want to another point. Something I said yesterday, which again, uh, but it's worth repeating, which is the Buddha is a super genius. Right. I mean, to describe a path to enlightenment, it's like really, really hard. It takes a genius. Very few people in history have ever done this. To describe a path that is understandable, accessible, and practicable to everybody, even harder. Very, very hard. It takes a real genius. To do that in a way that 2,500 years later is perfectly compatible with the scientific world, with the secular world, with people from other religions. That's impossible. There's no way it can be done. Only a super genius can do it. And guess who was a super genius? The Buddha. I, my admiration for this man. Total. Not just my admiration, but my, my gratitude for the Buddha. Total. Right? And, and if you ask me how I was able to reach young people successfully, it's because I simply stolen from this guy. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> I didn't do any work. So that's how powerful it is. And again, like I say, I suggest that everybody uh, take a look at uh, early Buddhist texts if, if you have the time. Why do we want to do this? Because it benefits the world. So remember the earlier the story I told about Upali? The, so the Buddha was very clear. He, he's not interested to increase the number of people calling themselves Buddhists. He's interested to help people. In this world, Unfortunately, we human beings are the only species capable of destroying the whole world. We are the only ones capable of destroying all life on earth. Why? Because we are 
we have greed, hatred, and ignorance. And the less greed, hatred, ignorance we have as a species, the safer the world is from us. Therefore, if we all practice Dharma, I think the, we, can, we do the whole world a, a service. Not just the whole world, we do all sentient life a service. So this, for me, is the main motivation. Not because we want to have more Buddhists, but because we want to bring benefit to the whole world. Okay, so that was basically my talk. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind indulging me, I'd like to... Uh, I like to be shameless and plug <laughs> some of my stuff. Oh, thank you. Oh, not, not fun. I'm done. Not done. <laughs> not done yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I just shamelessly tell you what I'm doing next. Uh, so what I'm doing next is I'm, I've written a book called Buddhism for All. Uh, yeah. Um, the sh- sh- so so we are, I hope we publish it at the end of this year or beginning of next year. We finished writing the text already. And uh, the, this is a shameless plug. The Dalai Lama blessed it. So this book is written with a with a Zen master. So it's, it's in a way, in a sense, written from an early Buddhist point of view, but also from a Zen point of view. So a lot of you would be, would be very familiar and comfortable with, with this. Uh, also, uh, <laughs> His Holiness blessed it. Also, it was vetted by Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, who the prominent, the eminent uh, uh, scholar in early Buddhism, and it was praised by the former Prime Minister of Bhutan. So, so yeah, I have all my bases covered, right? All three schools and a lay person. <laughs> all taken care of, oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, in closing, my friends, oh yeah, buy the book when it's out. <laughs> uh, there, I guarantee there will be a, a Korean edition. <laughs> I, I guarantee there will be a Korean edition because uh, Misam Sunim, uh, he says he, want to, he wants to uh, translate this to Korean. So, uh, in closing, my friends, uh, in closing, remember this chart? We can reverse this. All of us working together, teaching Dharma in the way that is, remember the four things, understandable, accessible, practicable, and impactful. We all do that. We can reverse this trend to the benefit of the whole world and to the benefit even of people, our friends who are not Buddhists. And with that, thank you, my friends. Uh, so I have some bad news. Uh, fortunately, you're not a parent. Uh, for those who are parents, I have even worse news for you, <laughs> uh, which is uh, that there is actually no way to force your kids to do anything. There's no way to force you to do anything. <laughs> That's the first thing you have to know. <laughs> so uh, the only way to encourage kids to, to practice is to get, speak at their level. Right, and find out what they need, and then give to them what they need, and speak their language. So what does it mean? Let me give you an example. Uh, I have friends who are trying to teach uh, very young kids, uh, kindergarten kids, to practice meditation. And the way they do it, they don't tell them, okay, you do shamatha and vipassana. Uh, nobody knows what that means. <laughs> they also don't tell them, okay, everybody sit cross-legged and bring attention to your breath. Uh. <laughs> So very skillfully, what they did for those kindergarten kids, they lie down on the floor, put a teddy bear on the belly, and watch the teddy bear. So teddy bear go up, teddy bear go down. Very fun, right? And that is mindfulness of breathing, right? So it's speaking at their level, and they're practicing meditation and dharma without knowing it, at their age, of course. And then 14 years old is even harder because they're teenagers. <laughs> Uh, at 14, uh, okay, again, you're not a parent, but uh, this is not your kid, but if you're a parent, uh, whatever you tell them, uh, most likely they will, like, it's negative. They'll, whatever you tell them, they're less likely to do it. <laughs> yeah, parents know what I'm talking about. So uh, the only way to do this, in my opinion, is by example. Right? So first, by example, do it yourself and show this. Uh, because what uh, they don't they don't do what you tell them, but they sometimes do what you do. In addition to example, is connection, right? Uh, it's like a constant connection. A uh, uh, best type of connection. Again, my opinion, and feel free to disagree with me. 
best type of connection is unconditional love. Right? No matter what you do, I still love you. Then there's a connection, plus example, plus understanding where he's from, where his uh, uh, difficulty is. Okay, if you're under a lot of stress, you're starting, why not do this? Why don't you just take a break? And just take a breath. <sighs> okay, better? Oh, okay. And then better still, I, I, heard, I went to this lecture, I heard from this guy, very handsome guy. He taught me three breaths. <laughs> Let's do these three breaths. <laughs> and then from there, see what happens. So that's, yeah, that's my, my suggestion. Mm. Thank you. Uh, the first part of my answer is they are the same. Uh, they are just different ways of looking at the same thing. And I can give you an example which is surprisingly not even based on Buddhism. So, so there is this experience. Okay, I, I'll, I'll describe the pipeline and then I come to the experience. Uh, when it comes to emptiness of self, there are at least two experiences in the pipeline. One experience is that there is only the observer and the observer has no identity. Identity completely fades away. Right. So now I'm standing here, I have an identity. I am I'm Chip Ming Tan. I, am, I did this, I did that. Uh, these are my memories, these are my life and so on. These are, people, these are things I like, these are things I don't like. And there is a possibility when the Shamatha and Vipassana get so strong, that identity fades away completely. And you're left with nothing but the observer, just observing senses, phenomena. And then you realize half of self is empty. Because the half of it, it's constructed, it's identity, it's entirely constructed by mind. And then there's a second half, which is even more profound, which is that even the observer disappears. There is only the observation. Observation without an observer. So uh, this is a prescription in a lot of, uh, given by the masters in, in, different, in different schools in different ways. But uh, people eventually arrive at this before they penetrate into emptiness of self. And what was fascinating to me, that, that relevant to your question, is that it's not exclusive to Buddhism. Right? So there are Christian saints, I was told, who had that experience. And they had that experience in a different, in a different uh, uh, methodology. So the Buddhist methodology is breath, body, and so on. The Christian uh, methodology is prayer and God. Right? And so when they do this, when they center prayer and they, concent they have that, from a Buddhist perspective, it's, it's perfection of concentration, right? of samadhi, then perfection of equanimity, perfection of mindfulness. And then they reach a point of emptiness, total emptiness of self. And because, because their entry point is through prayers, uh, the way they will describe this experience to themselves is that I am one with God. And there's one description uh, from one of my friends, uh, brother, brother David. Uh, he, he described it so beautifully. And I'll tell you what he says. He says four, four lines. So he says self and other. So other refers to God in these in his four lines. He said at first, there's no other. There's only self. Second, after that, there is self and there's other. So he sees God. Third, other and self are one and the same. There's no difference. Number four, fourth step, there is no self. There's only the other. So Brother David came to the same experience, but through the methodology of, of prayer. And like I said, because of that, his description is centered on godliness, on oneness. Right. Whereas if your methodology is different, if your methodology is more like Theravadan, this emptiness, then the description of the experience will be uh, uh, what's what? uh, nir niroda, empty, uh, complete cessation, emptiness, nothingness. Even though that's not, not, that's not an accurate description, by the way, but it's as close as you can get. And then if you do it from like a more Taoist and more Zen perspective, again, you get to more of a sense of oneness. So the description is different because that experience is undescribable. 
is describable only in relationship to things that you knew before. And therefore, the methodology, the in way, affects how it's described. Therefore, from other people's point of view, it sounds different. But I want to uh, suggest that they're the same experience. That's my suggestion. I could be wrong. <laughs> mm, mm, okay, so there are multiple questions. So let me, if I miss something, let me know later. Okay. Um, so the first part of the question is about uh, differences between East and West and how I approach it. So I have good news and bad news. Eh, eh, eh. The good news is that uh, in modern culture, there is, a, there is a lot of similarity. And we can see it just by seeing it. Right? For, for example, modern people, we all dress the same. Whichever country we are in, we dress about the same. Right? We all, like, people wear, wear Western uh, suit or you wear jeans and T-shirt. No difference. Uh, you go to every uh, major advanced city in the world, Tokyo, Seoul, Amsterdam, right, uh, Paris, they all look about the same. The buildings look about the same. So there is a certain uniformity of culture. Right? Everybody drinks Coke. Right? Everybody goes to McDonald's. Everybody eats sushi. And because of that, uh, the more significant uh, uniformity of culture is the influence of the scientific and secular thought. This is why we all, every religion in the world had the same problem. Right? Because uh, the, it's bec the world is becoming more secular, uni almost uniformly, and it's everywhere. So uh, that is good news because the way I teach it, because it's suited for the modern secular scientific mindset, it's like everywhere. So that's why I don't need a, I don't need adjustment, whether it's east or west. Right? I mean, this speech I, I gave here is, is I can give the same speech in America and I'll have a similar response. So that's the good news. So what's the bad news? <laughs> the bad news, okay. Uh, I'm trying to say this without without being offensive. So if I if I am offensive, please, please uh, slap me later, okay? Uh, the problem is not whether there's, there are some students they are hard to, harder to teach, and it's not because of east west uh, difference. It's because the cup is already full; they can't put anything inside. And it especially happened to the Buddhists. <laughs> what does <laughs> so what what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Uh, this, this is a real example. I have a friend who's a teacher who has two students. One of the students is the typical uh, Korean youth, like no, no practice, nothing. And then my friend teach him uh, mindfulness, but basically things that we talked about. This person is very receptive and can improve very quickly. The other student, sadly, uh, sorry, came from a Buddhist family. <laughs> so he knows everything about Buddhist teachings. Right? He's familiar with the Heart Sutra and so on. His practice has a lot of difficulty. Why? Because when you ask him to uh, bring focus to the breath and the body, the question he's asked is, I'm not, I'm not getting into emptiness. And emptiness is a true teaching. And this is obviously not a true teaching. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, of course, we have to like, tell him, teach him, sorry, the, the, explain the whole pathway, but it's hard to get because he has this mindset. True emptiness is the true teaching. Anything that doesn't get me to emptiness, straight away, is not it. Uh, I don't know how to solve this problem yet. I'm, I'm hoping that the, the work I'm doing, right, by emphasizing uh, first the early Buddhism, the way the Buddha talked about it, and emphasizing the understandability aspect and so on, will eventually help with this issue. So that in a world that, uh, where there's there is the strength of early Buddhism to, to help people who are secular and so on, and the same, the same thing, because, of, because of, like, the roots of uh, today's Buddhism, like Zen and, Thera and Theravada and Tibetan Buddhism, the roots are the same, the roots are the early Buddhism. And, and I'm hoping that by strengthening early Buddhism, because the roots are strengthened, the tree is also strengthened. And so simultaneously a flourishing of sectarian Buddhism. So I'm, hop I'm hoping that. Uh, in 20 years, you ask me again, I might say I fail. <laughs> Let me know. Mm, yeah. Uh, 
I'd like to say there is, there is not much difference and there's some difference. So the Buddha's emphasis was on the total freedom from suffering. And uh, so there are parts of suffering that has to do with daily lives that can be solved with what you call mind control. So for example, things that I talk about, right? If you're angry, <laughs> you can calm down. Already that, that's half the suffering go away. Right? And then you don't shout to your mother-in-law. The other half the suffering go away. So there is suffering that can be solved at that level. And so for that, I agree with you. It is, it is uh, has to do, it's the same basic as, my, as a mind con what you call mind control. Right? The, the analogy is like it's a strong man, right? If you practice a lot, they have muscles. And then when you have muscles, you can do things like if you're falling off a cliff, you can hold one because you're muscles, you're strong. Right? So in that sense, the training helps in those situations by creating uh, strength. So that is, uh, so yes, uh, and the Buddha's teaching, I think, go even further beyond that, which is that, uh, and I think Zen, Zen Buddhism, uh, as Sion expresses this most beautifully, which is that essentially Dharma is about letting go. The core of Dharma is letting go. So at first, you let go of the, of the, the big things like greed, and hatred, right? the, the obvious things. And then you let go of the subtler things, like, like wanting, like wanting pleasure, like attachment. And then you let go, you even started letting go of identity. And then let go of self test And let go of the observer, and so on. The entire training in Buddhism is, is just successive letting go. And every time you let go, somehow happiness increases. Right? So, so by, if you look at it from that point of view, which is also a correct way of expressing Dharma, the mind control, uh, it helps, but it only helps to let go. And I give you a, one example of how the two are related. So there's a very, there's a very famous uh, analogy given, I think, in, in the Zen tradition, which is very beautiful, but I had a problem with that. So the analogy is, uh, what do you call that? Uh, painful emotions, like anger and so on, is like hot coal. Like you're holding on to hot coal. That's why it's so painful. That's why you're suffering. So the solution is just let go of your coal. Then you're no more suffering. So you have any painful emotion, you have greed, hatred, jealousy, whatever, just let go. Easy. So I learned that teaching when I was young. And I say I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know how to let go. And so in this analogy, in order to let go, there's a, there's a very important assumption. The assumption is that I have control over these masses over here. Imagine I'm, I'm paralyzed, or I'm crammed, or I'm poisoned. There's no way I can let go. So the training, so there is real training, but the training is the ability to open my arms. So there is real training, strengthening, and at the end of the training, the real dharma is letting go. Oh, yeah. I hope that answers it. Mm. Uh, answer is definitely yes. And uh, in my experience, it works at multiple levels. Um, sorry, I'm trying to organize my answers in my mind. So, so maybe before that, I go to the big picture. And uh, this is important because a lot of modern uh, Buddhist traditions miss this really important point, which is if you look at the, the training in, described in early Buddhism by the Buddha, the whole path is a path of joy. And one indicator is when the king, when the king visited the Buddha, he said, he, said, he made this observation. He said the, the, the monks from the other religions, they all, they all look like they're suffering. But your monks, they're all happy. <laughs> and he, the description is, is, is they all have eyes of a wild deer. They're always so happy. So, why? And the Buddha uh, talked about why. And the Buddha actually described the whole path. And it's like, it's a joyful path. And the path begins with, uh, what do you call it? A uh, uh, sila, uh, virtue. And the Buddha says, virtue is not restricting you. It's not making you hard, life hard. What virtue does is it gives you the joy of blamelessness. 
right? Because now you now you no longer do something that you regret. Now you joy, and then uh, after that, the Buddha said, you train your mind to not grasp on to sense to sense desire, not reject. Uh, uh, averse, not be averse to things that are negative. Then he said, Buddha said, then this is the joy that is unsullied. A beautiful way of describing. And then the Buddha went on to describe the other meditative joy, which we talked about earlier. So, a joyful path. This this is really important. Uh, and so, the one reason I, I have to say it because modern in modern uh, tradition, if you go to most. There's a, there's a bifurcation. If you visit the, the really uh, highly attained masters, you find that all of them are very joyful. And yet, the teaching itself, very seldom you find joy at the center of teaching. I mean, they do talk about it, but it's not at the center. Whereas the way the Buddha taught it is at the center. Joy is the thing. So, uh, positivity. When you, so when I was young, I was very depressed, right? And uh, I didn't know why I was I was suicidal, uh, not just depressed. So uh, a lot of Korean, I know a lot of Korean young people are suicidal. So I know why it feels like I was there. So the way I got out of it was not, at first, was not through positive thinking. Was not through, uh, okay, thinking that no, I will, everything will be fine. I can do this. I can do it. I tried that, it didn't work. Because the negativity is still there. My depression was still there. The first positivity training that worked for me had nothing to do with positivity. It had to do with uh, what we call shamatha. Shamatha means uh, calming of mind. And, and what happened was, I was uh, sitting in meditation and doing the practice that uh, my teachers taught me, right? just bring attention to the breath, my breath, breath. And then uh, I suddenly had joy in my whole body and mind. And for about half an hour. Whoa. And later on, I discovered I can, I can keep doing it. And later on, I discover with more practice, I can do it on demand, anytime I want. Why? What type of, what type of, of crazy magic is there? The answer is there's no magic. Because it turns out that the mind, by its default, is joyful. And the reason the mind is not joyful is because every day it is surrounded by dirt. And the dirt is greed, hatred, ignorance, agitation, right? uh, jealousy. So all these negative states, they cloud this default mind. That's why we always experience negativity. And so by sitting in shamatha, the mind is calm and clear, and all these things temporarily disappear. I got the default mind. Joy, amazing. And that is the first realization, that to be happy, I don't have to do anything. I just have to be, right? So I think that is, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's an important lesson, by the way. So I think that in the, pos- in the pursuit of positive thinking, this is the first key, first key uh, 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 insight. And then after that, of course, then those other things begin to work. That I can do this, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a loser, blah, 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 they begin to work. Uh, then, by the way, I wrote a whole book on it. Shangwon, uh, can you just show the book? It's, it's Joy on Demand. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, uh, so beyond that, there are two other things that are make a mind also positive that I want to talk about briefly. Uh, so the second one is, is uh, just being aware of all the, what I call thin slices of joy. What are thin slices of joy? Uh, I'm thirsty, I drink water. I have about three seconds of joy. No, normally we don't notice. But if we start noticing it, the mind inclines towards it. Remember we talked about uh, mental habit? Now this is the mental habit of noticing joy. And then when it becomes a, method, uh, becomes a mental habit, remember what I said? Habit becomes personality. Personality becomes character. Character becomes you. And then the, the habit of noticing joy becomes you. So that's the, in brief, that's the second thing. 
Uh, the third thing is again something we covered earlier, which is to uplift the mind with kindness. So remember we did this exercise, we just wish for somebody to be happy and they're happier. Just do like a lot of those things. So these three things combine. Then if you add the positivity training, then it's perfect. Thank you. Uh, my answer to your first question, how to bring it to your company and, and convince your co-founders and so on, is to do very little. Minimum effective dose. That's, that's the, remember these three words, minimum effective dose. Uh, I can tell you the story that we did in, in Google. So, uh, so my boss's boss, uh, he was in charge of all of HR in Google. And imagine HR... Yeah, I don't know if you can imagine it, but uh, the, the people there are very uh, varied. There's a, a lot of variance, and not everybody, not everybody wants to do it, my, my, my fullness. <laughs> so what to do, right? And so uh, my boss's boss, Laszlo, he, the way he approached it, uh, among his, his top, these are the top leaders of HR in Google. He suggested, uh, he, took, he, took from a, he literally took a page from my book. They say, well, let's do this. Let's do two minutes of silent sitting be before meditate, before the meeting. So every meeting he does it, two minutes. I mean, people, some people are, uh, but it's only two minutes, so they, they endure it, right? And then he says, let's do this. Let's do this for one month. One month later, we decide whether to continue. And then, uh, so they did it for a while. And then after all, they uh, invited me to start teaching it. And uh, I wasn't available. I got one of my people to, so there's to teach them, so there's some variation, right? so and sometimes they do two minutes of breathing, sometimes they do two minutes of body awareness and so on, so there's some variety. So what happened one month later? One month later, uh, there was, uh, they, they came meeting, okay, now we decide what to do, as promised. So they all look at the one person who was most opposed in the beginning. So they all look at her, <laughs> I won't say her name, <laughs> they look at her, and she said, we should continue. What? Right? And he, she, she said, I noticed that since we started doing two minutes of silence, the meetings run smoother, somehow. So therefore, just do it. It's a, it's a two minute investment. So, so yeah, try this simple, minimum effective dose. Uh, I suggest that maybe, and I could be wrong, maybe two minutes is even that is, is, a, is higher than the minimum effective dose. Maybe just one minute. Maybe 30 seconds, maybe three breaths like we did before. That could be it. So that's one. Uh, your other question is about firing people. Uh, first thing I want to acknowledge is firing people is very, very hard. It's very, very hard. Um, one, my fr one of my friends who is a practitioner, uh, the way he put it is like firing people is the real dharma. <laughs> it's the real practice of dharma because it's so hard. So first acknowledge that to yourself. This is the hardest thing. This is the true drama. And the way to do that, uh, first is, is don't, I mean, you do what you have to. Don't ever tell yourself, I cannot fire people because I want to be nice. It doesn't work, the real world doesn't work that way. So the way to do that is to fire people compassionately. And then you might ask, what does that mean? Uh, one example that I know of, uh, I wrote about it in Search Inside Yourself. Right? When, when, yeah, when the GE, the company, they would try to fire not just one person, the whole, the whole team, they fire everybody, they did it very skillfully. They give them two years of advance notice. They didn't just say, okay, out of the door. And then the two year advance notice, they helped them to find new jobs. And two years later, 97% of those who were fired, they say, this was a good employer. So they maintained goodwill, 97% goodwill, even though they fired people. And so for you, I will say find a way to do that. Mm. Thank you. <laughs>